So what other operating systems should we support? Other Linux? And, and I'm out of ideas, really. I'm looking now for exotic things, but... Windows? What about GNU Hurt? <laughs> Windows? You <laughs> know it's my pet project. <laughs> uh, so it's not that difficult, really. Now that I have delved into that quite deep, it's totally doable. I would say Raspbian should work quite fine with the support we have for Debian already, but uh, we should still test it and see if we need to do some changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then add support for the BSD family and GNU herd and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> really exotic things. I'm a big fan of um, operating systems that are not just Linux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the problem with, with BSD is this port thing where you build the the package is actually the, the binaries instead of just downloading them yeah that's uh yeah interesting how to support that definitely okay cool yeah i think we can start already yeah i think it is time already so welcome everyone to this edition of the uni communities hours which by the way is quite special so now Yay! First year of the Unique Community Hours! Wow! Unbelievable! Awesome. Yes, when I first started talking about this, yeah, we were not sure if it will have some traction, some adoption, and we have, uh, I would say, the result has been awesome. We have got some very good feedback from you guys, very good ideas, for instance, Ansible, that we will be presenting a bit later. Um, was an idea that came from the community, and yeah, it's it's now there even in in Susan Manager. Oh, but yeah, that will arrive in one month. <laughs> I, <laughs> I say, okay. And I have to say that I'm very happy to see how the community is growing, especially now that the at the mailing list and the guitar people is helping each other. So that's a great thing to see that the uni is growing and it's my it's in, it's in my opinion in a healthy state yeah it's it's very very good a very good development i will say so thank you all and then we can move to the next thing so well if i can jump to the next slide yeah okay this is the agenda for today so as you know, like if I recall correctly, one week ago we launched the Uni 2105. So we are going to review what's new there. Then we will talk about this uh, new country repository. The announcement was made by, I think, one week ago as well by Johan. And finally, Pablo will talk us about the Ansible integration in Uni that is going to be part of 202106. So, well, let's get started. First of everything, what's new on the latest universe? We did some changes to the supported operating systems. So the most likely the most interesting thing is the tech preview for OpenSUSE Micro OS and Forestly Micro. As you know, if you had a look at the release notes, the support is still not complete. There are some things that don't work, but at least you can already onboard. You can already install packages, but being this a uh, transactional system, after installing packages, you still need to reboot. And uh, well, sadly, it's not working yet, but it should be working soon. The action chains in this case are not working, working properly. So you still need to um, do a, no, not a manual review, but you need to schedule a reboot action for, for this. But other things are working quite well. So we invite you to have a look at it, test it, give us your feedback. And yeah, let's hope that we will have it at something really stable. I would say maybe, I don't know, in two, three uni versions. We will see how this is evolving. And, and then, by the way, we, of course, accept code contributions too. Well, yeah, that goes without saying, of course, if you want to submit. And remember, fixes is not just about code. If you see something that you think it's not clear at the documentation and you think that you can explain better, we will welcome all your contributions to the doc as well. So you can help in any way you can. And other than that, well, this is maybe less interesting, but we are uh, deprecating some operating systems that are already end of life. Ubuntu 16.04 and CentOS, Oracle, Rehel 6, and all, all the family. Deprecated doesn't mean that they 
will stop working with Ubuntu, sorry, with uh, Uni 202105. It just means that the client tools will not be maintained by us anymore, but uh, it should, things should still work for, maybe for a long time, we still don't know. And anyway, if you still want to support them for any reason, and if you want to submit patches for them, then of course we will accept them. No problem about that. But of course, this is not just about operating systems. We have some more new stuff such as TLS for Prometheus, which is going to allow you secure communication between the exporters and the, and the Prometheus server. You can combine this as well with basic HTTP authentication. Uh, we have the new Prometheus 2.26.0 version. The, change, the list of changes is really huge, so it doesn't make sense discussing them here. Now you can migrate clients from OpenSUSE Lib to SUSE Linux Enterprise Server if you want to get uh, support. We added the Notify beacon for the deb-based clients, which means that now if you install, remove, or update a package directly at Ubuntu or Debian, the Unix server will see this. Still, remember that this is not really recommended because all the management of the packages, you should do it through the, through the server. You can use the API or SPCMD or the web UI, but it's best if you do it from the server. You can also now specify which is the primary FQDM for, for your systems, which is something really interesting if you want to configure the target addresses for the monitoring with Prometheus. For that, virtual that, yeah. That, let me just interview you, sorry. Julio, the, the use case for this, for setting the primary uh, fully qualified domain name is mainly when you have systems behind NAT, and that's pretty common if you have a large number of systems or when you are in public cloud where your public cloud instances don't know their external IP addresses or even their DNS names. They, they only know their internal IP addresses. And the problem is Prometheus, what it sees is uh, Prometheus and Andorra Paz of, of Uyuni. What they see is this internal IP address and of course the communication fails. So now by setting this primary FQD and you can tell Uni no. When you are trying to communicate, use exactly this address or this DNS name, and then communication will work, no matter if you are uh, properly with the IP properly configured on the system or if you are behind that or yeah, doing any kind of routing or, or anything. And yeah, where or... do you set this? Is it in a formula or in the in the system details directly? Okay. Or it's via a... API as well. Yes, of course. Yeah, and by the way, this is some, this is useful as well if, for example, you use Amazon Web Services and you have an instance which has a public and private host name, but you don't use an elastic IP, so only the private host name is, is static, then that is what you want to use as FQDM for the system for the monitoring because the public one will change. And now you can specify that as well. Okay. Well, if you have questions, of course, as always, just interrupt me, and we don't really need to wait until the, the end of the presentation. So, virtualization, we have now some fine tuning, which means that you can do CPU pinning, you can do some special memory configurations, auto start for network and storage pools if you are creating a new virtual machine, so you don't need to start them uh, in advance. Now the virtual console is even available when the instances stop, which is really useful if you want to debug any kind of uh, startup problems. Then we have something that people requested because we had it for the traditional client tools, but not for salt, which is a custom data as pillars. This is equi equivalent to, to the custom information via macros and in the end, it allows you to pass any custom information you may want to solve clients, be it normal minions or SSH minions. We have now retracted patches as well, and allowed me to explain this because otherwise I know that some people will get confused. Patches from SUSE can now be marked as retracted, but that means that they cannot be installed normally anymore after they are marked as such, but you can still force the installation if you want. You may specify the exact version of the, of the patch and the patch will get installed. And 
if the patch was already installed at any system and at any client, it will not get removed, removed from that system unless you remove it specifically. Okay, we, so we explained this, I think, in full at the past two minute community hours or two minute hours ago. So, really, yeah, listen to don't the recording by this one. Yeah, don't <laughs> start the debate again, please. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it is explained at the release notes as well, but I wanted to insist again so nobody panics if they were not where they were not at that at those community hours because I think they were not recorded. I think we had the discussion before we started recording it, but don't panic. This is not going to modify any of your clients, okay? Good, then the next one is about the client systems being, forward, being forwarded to SUSE Customer Center. This is something else where I, mean, where, where I want to clarify something. First of all, this will not work if you don't add any SCC account to, a, to your UNI server, and usually you are adding only an uh, ISCC account if you have a subscription to SLI. Even if you add the account, it can still be disabled if you don't want it. Just check the release notes. But so the, idea, the idea of this is that you will be able, when you are registering a SUSE operating system or SUSE product uh, using SUSE Connect, you could see those systems in SCC. But if, if those systems were behind a SUSE manager or a UNI server or SUSE manager server, then you could not see them. And everybody was super confused. Where are my systems? Exactly. Why can't I see them? And now we are offering a possibility to have those systems in SCC so that you don't have to wonder about this. OK, so it's, again, uh, a usability feature because many people ask for this. We are not trying to spy on you or anything like that. OK? Exactly. And as I was going to say, this information is only sent for statistical purposes and product research, but nothing else at all, okay? So this was something that was requested. It's very useful because then you onboard 30 systems, 30 SLE systems, and you can see them at SEC. Before that, it was very confusing. But anyway, if for some reason you don't like it, you can still disable it. Check the release notes. Then, Another really interesting one, which is the configuration state management, or as people like to call it, from where are my states coming from the instances. So with this, at the high state page of the clients, now you can check from where each of the states are coming. Because right now, if you have a lot of organization and different states coming from different places, it's impossible to know. Not sure if you want to clarify something about this, Pao. Um, about which one? Sorry, I was looking for the release notes. The configuration state summary. Ah, yeah. Okay, well, from where that. my states are coming. Yes, uh, another historical request where you have a ton of uh, different uh, configuration channels, system groups, organizations, and all of that. In the end, people were were not knowing where the states were coming in the end. And w now it's, I think, very, very easy to grasp this information. It's even shown hierarchically, I think, if I remember correctly. Okay, then another one for people using SLI, live patching made easy with filter templates, because if you are familiar with live patching, you will know that you cannot have any kernel installed if it is not compatible with live patching, because otherwise you cannot use live patching with this. Uyuni will help you to install the correct kernel on your SLE systems. Uh, so for now, this is only working for, I think for SLE 15, all the, all the versions. We also have the new HTML documentation for the API. Maybe if you were having a look at the website for Uni, you notice that now the documentation link is, uh, is a menu and it will offer you a link to the usual usual guides that you already know, but to the API documentation, which in my opinion is easier to use than the old documentation that that uh, we we used to have. But that is still available at the, at the server for now. 
And finally, something that, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's missing at the release notes. We missed it, but we will add it for 2021-06, which is the open SCAP content, which is basically the SCAP profiles for um, SUSE Linux, OpenSUSE, Rehel, CentOS, Oracle, Ubuntu, and Debian, which will help you to audit the security of such operating systems. As I said, it's not at the release notes, but if you go to the documentation for Unit 2021-05, it's on the administration guide and you can see there how to use it. Yeah. And by the way, there's not only the profiles to scan and audit the systems, but also the remediation scripts and Ansible playbooks to remedy. Mm, not yet Ansible playbooks, Paul. Remember that Ansible is for 2021-06. Well, well, the content is there. The, yeah, that it the is usable or not is a different story. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and well, that's it. Those are not all the changes in 2021-05, but it's what we thought is more relevant. So before we jump into the next thing, any questions, any comments? Uh, on the SUSE Customer Center thing, that's a another one of those uh, task matic uh, system tasks that runs in the background every so often, right? It, it's running every so often, yes. And also action when when you add or remove systems. Well, I mean, I have in my Uyuni server, I only have OpenSUSE and CentOS systems, but that that's still running. I see it running in Taskomatic. I don't have obviously any SCC credentials. So, is there a way for me to like tell it to not run? <laughs> yes, uh, I, I pasted the link in there in the chat. It's okay. in the wisdom. It, there's a setting, a confusion setting that you can set in etcrhn.com, and then it will be disabled. Yeah, that disables the job, but rest assured that if you don't have the SCC account, no data is being sent to SCC. Just only the task is running and checking that, hey, you don't have an SCC account. Right, okay. right. There's nothing for it to send to. So I just didn't want it thrashing and timing out and all that stuff necessarily. How often will this be done? Daily, monthly, weekly? Can't remember. I think it's daily at least, maybe more often, but I cannot I will remember the I details. will check momentarily here and tell you. Because I think if we cache the changes in case at that moment the connection to SCC is not available for some reason, because we want to make sure that a deleted system is deleted from SCC, a deleted system unit. And same if you add something and at that moment you cannot connect to SCC, want to make sure that that system will be will show in SCC as soon as the connection is again available. So yeah, I, I think, think it's running every 15 minutes or something like that, the MGR forward registration. Thing. Yeah, but I think that if you have any kind of failure connecting to, to SCC, then it will run less frequently. I seem to remember that that was explained, but don't, yeah, not really sure. Yeah, but we can check and come back to you. Yep, exactly. Yeah, Pablo beat me to it. It's 50, every 15 minutes it tries to run. Okay, any more comments, questions? Then let's jump into the next thing, which is, which is the country repository. As I told, it was announced by Johan like one week ago. Now, what is the country repository? Well, it's a Git repository. I should probably add the link here, by the way. But anyway, it's at the it's at the announcement at the website. We added it to Twitter today. It's at the mailing list as well. The name at the Uni project organization at GitHub, it's just Contrib. It's a repository with a set of scripts and tools that are not officially distributed right now as part of Uni, which doesn't mean they are not good or they are not useful because indeed they are. 
as of today, you will see that there we have two folders. The first one is called Hub Tools. Those are two tools to install and configure the system manager hub. And then we have the Uni tools as well. It's a big collection collection of Uni tools. Maybe some people is familiar with them because they were known as Susan uh, Manager tools. They are from Michael Brookhas. And uh, among other things, because you have a lot of them, there is, for example, one which is very interesting. It's called system underscore rereg.py, which can be used to help moving a client from one proxy to another. But as I told, there are quite a few of them. I don't remember something like 20. So if you have all the details, you can just have a look at the repository and check the, doc the documentation there. If the next question is going to be when we are going to add them to Uni to make them official, it depends. In the it depends on the interest that each one uh, that the community has on the on each one of the on the of the scripts, but we are not ruling out that we can include it. Uh, we can include them later. Yeah, we already have a divided packaging for utils, right? Yeah, where we the have extras. the extras that are not supported. Yep. So, of course, if we see that the community finds those scripts interesting, or at least some of them, then we can think about packaging as part of extras or maybe as part of a new package. It, it depends. We will see. And that's it for the country repository. I hope Michael Brookhouse's name gets put in there so he gets some credit, right? It is there, yes. <laughs> yes, of course, he's the author of the whole Uni Tools folder, so yeah. Okay, then if there are no more questions, it's time for Pablo to tell us about Ansible on Uni. <laughs> okay, thank you, Julio. Let Just me... about the hub tools, sorry. I was mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, the hub tools, uh, yeah, I'm still updating them. Uh, we have the first customer really going live with the hub tool, with hub. So that's good news. And yeah, adding some more stuff to it so that it will be better usable for the future. All right. Uh, I hope you can see now the slides. Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay, so let's just go ahead. So as Julio mentioned, um, and as you already know, we have been working uh, and researching about how we can uh, uh, give some integration with Ansible uh, in Uyuni. And uh, yeah, and for this uh, release 2021-05, there is already some progress, but it's not yet fully ready. But we wanted to let you know, uh, yeah, what's going on and we, what what is basically new on this release and would be available for the next one. So uh, with this, uh, what we have pushed so far is a way so you can basically operate your Ansible control node using Uni. So what is new, as I told you, is that we provide this initial integration with Ansible as a technology preview. We are adding the Ansible package in the lib15 client tools. So that would enable us to, to basically have a uni in your open source um, and have an open source which is your Ansible control node. The version that we are pushing is 2.9.21. Um, yeah, and it would allow you to register your Ansible control nodes into uni. It will allow you to display your inventories, discover your playbooks, and also run those playbooks uh, using Uyuni. Uh, this would come with a new UI, which allows you to do these operations on the control node. It will come also with XML RPC endpoints, new endpoints for doing all the operations that we are now able to do with for the Ansible control nodes. And as Julio mentioned, this was also something that has been uh, requested uh, since long time uh, from the Uyuni community and also from, from SUSE customers as well. So there is an, an interest there uh, to be able to operate with Uni, uh, sorry, operate uh, Ansible uh, with Uyuni. As an important note here, um, this is not yet fully ready for 2021 05. 
It's currently available on Unimaster, the development, brand, uh, development version, uh, but uh, it should come and everything should be ready for 2021 06. So let's go and take a look at the demo. So what I have here is yeah, just a small uh, Uni environment. I have these three client register and one of those clients, this OpenSUSE one, I already have Ansible installed and I have, um, you know, some inventory here for, for, for some of the, 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 the systems that I'm managing with the Ansible. So let's just do a normal pin just to see that this is currently an operate uh, an environment that is running an operational. There are few few systems that are down that they just they are, are just going to fail, right? And I have here on this place a few inventories as well. I have this one, uh, for example, this one. It's a small playbook here. Um, yeah, so let's let, let's think that we have this this control node. So what I wanted to now do is okay, I have this system registered in, in my uni, and I want to uh, enable uh, this system as an Ansible control node. So first thing we need is to have the system registered in our uni, which is the case. Now, how, how can I tell you to Uni that this is an Ansible control node? We go to system properties and you see there is a new system type here, similar to the container we host. So we can enable this, update. It would tell us that we need to run the high state. This high state is basically um, just ensuring that the Ansible is installed, which indeed it is. Okay, so yeah, and as you know, as you notice, probably there is a new tab here that just appears after we basically enable this Ansible control node uh, in the, the properties of the system. So let's wait until this is running. But yeah, anyway, this is not doing much because Ansible is already installed. So let's go to the Ansible tab. First thing we find we we, we see here is a control a control node configuration. We have a place where we can specify where uh, the playbooks are inside this system and also the inventory files that we want to, to, to visualize here. So let's just go. I told you before that I have some playbooks here on SRB playbook. Let's just add that path. And I have also some uh, more playbooks in these SRB Ansible examples coming from the, the, the Git repository for Ansible example playbooks. And as I also show you, I have my uh, main inventory here. So yeah, this UI basically allows you to add more uh, path here for both inventories and, and, and playbook. OK, so we have set an initial configuration. Now let's go to the inventory page. When we go here, we see each one of the different inventories that we define. We can click on it. And this, was, this, this is going to display, uh, display you here, the content, the raw content from this inventory coming from Ansible. We see also some matching about the listed, you know, the systems that are in this inventory. We see that some of them are already registered in this uni server and some other are not. All right, so this is, a, and we also see information about the bars and the groups that this inventory is basically providing us. So this basically enables a way to visualize the inventories that we have there. So now moving back to playbooks, in the same way for each one of the paths that we defined, we can click and it would basically discover the playbooks that are under that path. Uh, in this case, we see a few of them. Um, this one is the one that I just showed you a moment ago. If we click on it, we see, well, let me go, just go back first. I just wanted to show you some other thing first. So for this one inventory here, we see that it provides us the, 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 the link to basically go inside this inventory. This is the full path on this system. And it also tells you that this comes with a custom inventory because you know sometimes invent playbooks uh, are also providing some inventory file. So it, this is also shown here. So if we cl click on this one, we go to the playbook schedule page, 
we see the content of the playbook. So this is the playbook that I just showed you before. And this would allow us to schedule the execution of the playbook, to run this playbook. We can run it on certain daytime, as usual for the actions, as part of an action chain as well. And there is this uh, inventory path selector here. If we click on it, we can select the different inventories that we have enabled for the control node but it would also allow us to trigger this inventory using the custom inventory that was found together with the playbook file. So, well, in this case, let's just go with this one. Um, well, this particular uh, playbook, what it's doing, as you see, it has a task for installing HTTPD on this CentOS server and then copying some index file and enabling in the service. So let's just try it. And let's see what's happening. So playbook installation, playbook execution was uh, triggered. It's still on pending. It would take a moment to, 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 to be picked. Let's see. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Not sure why this is still. Mm, take some time for you need to pick the action. Let's wait. It's, by the way, is my <laughs> is everything running over here? Yeah. And at, at this stage, is is salt in a way involved or is it completely Sorry, out of scope? Is is salt yes. involved so, in, in this stage or not? Yes. So you know the, the, the way of communicating with the register system is via salt. So in the end, we have a, there is a salt module called Ansible gate, which basically allows us to operate the Ansible, trigger the playbook, and do some stuff using. Okay, now. <laughs> So, Sorry, yeah. I didn't. I didn't get you. Can, could you repeat that, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, the way we use we, we do for ex, for running the playbook on this system is basically using a salt module. So in the end, we do a salt uh, command that we execute on this minion that calls the Ansible gate module, which in the end operates the Ansible CLI, right? And then it produces. It, it, it makes Ansible playbooks to run and it gets the output from the Ansible playbook execution and we get it as a result of a state application in salt, basically. That's what's happening under the hood here. Mm -hmm. But so the important thing here is that we are not converting the Ansible playbook to salt. Exactly. We are executing it natively. Exactly. So it's Ansible, the one that is execute, is running the, 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 the playbook in the end. Mm -hmm. And we just get the, the results for that execution coming from Ansible and we just get it as a result from the state execution that we have. So if we click here, as a result of the execution of, of the running of play, we, we see this is actually a normal state output, let's say on the on the salt world. And we see the task here, HTTP, the different tasks that were defined on the playbook that were executed by Ansible. And this is an output coming from Ansible, but just embedded into the output from the set state execution. So you give okay. it over to the control node and it it gives the the how is it called the the, the recipe of what was the name of the playbook the, yeah. the playbook is given over to the minion or to the client no no no, no. The, 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 the 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 playbooks are already on the system on the control node on the control right? node yeah they are there they are stored there and what we do is we tell the control node okay run this playbook but we do all of that using salt basic okay yeah okay and so then this the is how Ansible works, actually. Yeah, so yeah. We are just using it the way Ansible is meant to work. So, for instance, instead of, of passing the nodes where to, to run the, 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 the playbook as variables, uh, they are inside the playbook itself. It, this is different from salt. In salt, you will tell salt so execute this thing, this, this state on this node. Here, you just say Ansible execute this playbook. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Can it also work if I have a playbook and I have no access to the control node? So I, I there's a control node, but I don't have 
the I can access that one. I only have the playbook to be executed. You have to. You need to have the system register in, in Uyuni. So if you have your Ansible control node registered in Uyuni, then I don't have that. I don't have it. I only have a playbook. No, no. Then you need a control node, which is a system register in, in, in Uyuni. That's the first requirement. Once you have a system, then uh, this, when you have the system registered, then you can operate it. We cannot yet operate um, a, an Ansible control node, which is not a register a register system in Uyuni. So now I only have a playbook. Eh? So I got I received a playbook uh, via Git, and I need to execute that playbook. Yeah, but you need an Ansible control node to execute that playbook. Yeah, I mean, it, that's another way that you could do that is by installing Ansible on that node and then invoking directly with salt, invoking uh, with Ansible gate directly from salt, calling it from salt. You could do that, but that's not the way that you will really use Ansible playbooks typically. So it would work, yeah. but it's. Yeah. The problem is I have one security playbook that I, yeah, they want me to use that one and not use uh, any other. Mm -hmm. In that case, that will be the option. So just call it from salt using Ansible gate. And yeah. Okay. Then I, I would pick but the, the, Yeah, mm -hmm. but the interesting question is you still need to have Ansible somewhere. So you need to install exactly. the Ansible package anyway, <laughs> somewhere. So it will yeah. not be the control node, but you will be creating your own control node, even if it's only temporary. Okay. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure, no problem. So yeah, um, as you saw, the playbook uh, that succeed the execution, it deploy this file enables uh, yeah you know the HTTP server and it, this is the file that we just deployed. And one interesting thing, as I as you saw, we run this playbook here, which is the the, the our Ansible control node, and the playbook was targeting this one. And if we go to events and history, you see that we have here a package refresh list, uh, package refresh uh, action that was basically triggered automatically when the playbook installed uh, HTTPD on this CentOS 7 minion, right? And then this produced basically the, 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 the package profile get updated into uh, Uyuni automatically, right? Because of the beacon. So yeah, that's basically what I wanted to show you on the demo. This is what we currently uh, have to, you are able to operate through your playbooks. And let me just go back to the slides because there was some extra things I wanted to, oh, sorry, demo. All right, so the next steps on the roadmap are, uh, of course, we want to improve the UI UX uh, experience. Um, yeah, there are yeah things that we can still polish on the UI. Uh, we would like to also run the playbooks in test mode. Uh, thanks for the 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 the, the, uh, the community for 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 giving us this this feedback. Uh, this is something that we must have here. Uh, so a way to run the playbooks uh, using this Ansible div and check. Uh, modes to basically do a ra dry run execution without basically changing anything, and then see the, in the same way that we currently do for the for the high state execution. Uh, then we want to improve the the parsing of the inventories and playbooks, so being able to display the groups and bars and everything that is content there uh, in a more uh, you know visual way instead of just be displaying the raw uh, inventory or, or yeah, you know all this information in raw, but trying to to yeah get a better experience there. Another thing is trying to uh, easily provide an easy way to bootstrap those systems that are managed by your Ansible but are not yet registered in SUSE Manager. In, sorry, in, in, in Union SUSE Manager. Um, and also, yeah, the ideas that we have in mind: playbook with forms. This kind of, uh, in a similar way to, 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 to formulas with form, have a way to basically inject variable content into the playbooks. That's these are things that we have in mind, and also uh, you know support newer Ansible versions uh, like 
2.10, 2.11, we would see. Um, so final notes. Um, the Ansible control node must be registered sole client in Uni, either sole minions or sole SSA minions. At this point, Uni simply operates your Ansible control node. It does not configure it. So we are not deploying keys or anything. The, the control node must be already configured. And what we are doing is allowing Uyuni or making Uyuni to be able to operate that control node. That's what we have at this point. Then the Ansible inventories, uh, again, are not yet created by the Uyuni. Uh, so it basically reuse the, the, the inventories that are uh, already existing in the control node. We have no way yet to uh, modify those inventories. So yeah, that's more or less what we wanted to show you today. I hope you have a better idea on how this Sensible integration is going uh, on Uni, and hopefully for the next version of Uni, you are going to be able to start, uh, yeah, you know, operating and doing whatever fancy experiment with this and action change and everything. So yeah, if you have any questions about it, please. yes, I have a question. Sorry. Sure. Go ahead. Um, most of the time, um, the Ansible code is located on a Git repository. Um, is there a plan or something to be able to uh, take it uh, or to specify perhaps a Git location? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. So that's in our roadmap. And but there's a workaround that you can use currently, and it's using GitFS. And so you can define a directory. In, in your Ansible control node where you, are, where you are mounting a Git repository. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, exactly. So at this point, we, we, it, it's even documented, by the way, sorry, Pablo. It's even documented for salt, but it will work the same for uh, Ansible. It's in the uni documentation. I can paste the link. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, so that's the idea. Like, at, at this moment, um, yeah, the, the playbooks needs to be there on the Ansible control node, but yeah, as, as Paul is mentioning, you can work around this using GitFS, and we have this on the roadmap, uh, so we will be providing also an easy way, so you can just put the Git repo, and then it would take the, the playbooks directly from there, so you skip this uh, manual step of GitFS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so Sounds... this is considered this as initial support for Ansible, initial yeah. integration for Ansible. There's still a long way to go. So we want to offer something that will be an alternative to Ansible Tower in the end. And for that, we have identified what we need to do to be an alternative to these job templates that Ansible Tower provides. For that, we will need recurring state that has been requested for a long time, uh, reusable action chains, uh, playbooks with forms. Also for the workflows, so these these two features, job templates and and workflows from Ansible Tower require three things uh, that we have already identified, and then there's of course the thing about the keys and certificate certificates management, which will come later. But yeah, there's a roadmap for this. But anything that you can think of that you miss, please tell us because that will help me prioritize the work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When, when you target all your machines with salt, do you also target the machines that are controlled by the control node, by the Ansible control node? Not at this moment. So the the, the system that are, are so let's say um, the system that are in the in an Ansible inventory that are managed by Ansible, those systems might be registered as a salt minion already, or maybe not. If they are already re registered as sole minion, then of course you can, on a normal sole execution, you can target them. But if they are not yet accepted as a sole minion, then you cannot do that. Uh, there are ways, so we can, um, and that's what I meant by easy bootstrapping of systems that are managed by Ansible. So let's say I have a, a system managed by Ansible, which is not yet registered, on Uni, so it's not yet a salt minion, uh, then there are ways uh, so we can, or salt can, let's say, reuse the contact information that, I, that is in the Ansible inventory to basically be able to target that Ansible managed system via salt SSH, and then being able to execute the bootstrapping automatically. Or yeah, there are different ways to do that. We were also thinking on having a playbook that somehow we provide 
so we can basically which basically bootstrap the the, the, the system so we can apply this or run this playbook uh, targeting those um, systems that we want to bootstrap and unregistered in the, in the uni for those that are not yet registered. So there are different approaches for this, and that's something that we also have on on mind. Uh, yeah, but at the moment, mm, yeah, if they the system are not if those Ansible managed clients are not registered as all minion, then you cannot target those uh, using soft. Okay, good to know. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Do you have more questions? There was a question if we are going to allow editing this, the playbooks directly from the Uni web UI. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one because there I have a predicament between uh, doing that, editing, like we always solve, or completely removing the editing support. And, not, um, and then let's say you just do that externally. If, if we go mm -hmm. for fully Git ops, like integrating the Git repository, like we have with the uh, image builder and with the Docker builder uh, part. In that case, we allow you to specify a, a Git repository directly and you maintain the, um, to edit those uh, key recipes or Docker files externally. And that could be an approach, right? So this is something that it's not yet uh, fully decided or considered because yeah, you could say also, what if we just integrate Visual Studio Code here, like uh, GitHub Spaces, something like that could be really cool, although it's a huge component. So supporting that is also a good question. But imagine that you would, when you click on a playbook or an assault state, instead of just uh, showing this little editor, uh, you, you get a full Visual Studio Code running your browser. So yeah, it's not fully decided what to do there. Of course, yeah, suggestions and especially code from the community help in that, in deciding that. <laughs> yeah, so at this point of the integration, we are not yet, let's say, uh, pushing anything to the control node. What we are doing is just is simply operating a control node, which is already configured. Right, right, right. you're just consuming it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Of course, there are, we can do more fancy stuff, but what we currently have is that. That's why we are not allowing editing, because we are just displaying the content of the things that are already there. But yeah, you know, let's see <laughs> in the future what we are doing. So the first thing to do probably is to, to try to allow to inject variable content for the playbooks. Because that would not require yet, uh, still not require to, to to push necessarily anything. But yeah, at some point there were also ideas about holding a, or having a, um, like a like a playbook inventory. Sorry, playbook catalog, uh, like something like configuration state channel, but for play, for for playbooks. Yeah, you know, <laughs> there are a lot of things that might be considered here. So yeah, let's go step by step. And yeah, uh, let's gather as much feedback as possible from everyone using this and try to see how this fits on the needs uh, from customer and people. Um, yeah, and that would also help us to clarify uh, which are the next steps that we should focus on. Yeah. All right, any more questions? It's pretty exciting, Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> then, yeah, not sure if you mentioned already, Pablo, that if someone wants to try it, they can use master. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I mentioned at the beginning that this is not available yet for uh, on this 2021-05 version. But it is indeed already in where I put this thing here. It's available currently at Ujuni Master Devil. So, well, Ujuni Master. So, if you have some Ujuni Master instance, then you would be able to start playing around this. 
I have to insist that that is not production ready, is mm -hmm. not upgradable, but you can install it to give it a try to and see what's coming on from the next version. So yeah, feel free to play with that. Yeah, yeah, upgrade not supported, right? Yeah, <laughs> and another way of trying mm -hmm. this, if you don't want to try it in Unity Masters with SUSE Manager, the release candidate was mm -hmm. released early this week. Uh, it's completely free to try. I pasted the link in the chat how to get a beta code that will run, I think, until the end of July. So that should give you ample time to try this. Cool. All right. So, yeah, if you don't have any more questions, then I would see. I would say that's all on my side. My side. And in any case, you know, uh, feel free to reach me or reach any one of us uh, for providing your feedback, your thoughts, or your feelings about how this uh, Ansible integration is going and yeah, how we can improve that. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. That was fantastic. Thank you. Okay, and now remember the community hours is not just about presenting, so we still have some around eight minutes. If you want to discuss something else, we can do it. Or if there is something you want to comment, you want to ask. Well, there's something that I forgot to, to mention is, uh, you know that we have a, a student accepted by Google Summer of Code. She will be working with us and uh, uh, renewing or, or modernizing some web pages. Um, but uh, we also got accepted in another program by the Chinese government. So if you want, if you speak Chinese, especially because otherwise, yeah, I can tell you that uh, the website is mainly in Chinese. I'm pasting the link here. Um, they will, the Chinese government will pay students, university students uh, to uh, work on, on a unit. For instance, in supporting some other exotic operating system like this Open Euler operating system that's done for China or any of the projects that we have there. So the, the page is a bit messy, as I said. But yeah, if you're interested, get in touch with me. My email is, is there also. I think they pay you um, 12,000 renminbi. If, I don't know if, even if I'm pronouncing this well, which is uh, like uh, 1,800 US dollars. Do okay. We, this is. I guess this is a question. Do we know like how many downloads of Uyuni or where, or do we have anything that gives us any insight into that? I no. can't reply to that. Not yet, but I know that the OpenSUSE guys are trying to get some obviously anonymous data about that. The problem, the main problem with that is for downloads is the mirrors. How do you measure um, downloads? when there are mirrors and you cannot account for those but at least right, it's right. yeah right. it's not geographically one... geographically uh, assigned based on proximity or yeah what? but remember that every request usually goes through the mirror director download open source that's mm. the unless you specify a mirror manually which you should not do because then the mirror can go down or whatever else you are you always using the mirror director mm, well we'll see what the open source heroes can can give us i'm really interested in that data but yeah we have vitek as well involved in that <laughs> But no, the short reply is, as of today, no, we don't have the data, sorry. Um, another question. So UniUni releases and Leap 15.3, how are they going to be uh coordinated so will it be like 202107 or 202108 that is based on 153 or how is that going to work 
The plan is that the next two unit release, which should be 202106, if there are no problems, should be already based on OpenSUSE LIB 15.3. If you have a look at the master project at OBS, you will see that right now we already started building the, the repositories using lib 15.3. I'm just configuring the continuous integration to start testing it, see how things are going. But yeah, my expectation is that we should not have big problems running on top of 15.3. Then we just need to design the migration scripts and we will be ready for 2021-06. So will that also come with uh, a change to PostgreSQL 13? That's right, and uh, sold 3002. Yeah, the full migration, the full change and news in the operating system. In fact, if you try hard enough, you can already even install Unistable on 15.3. Now you're challenging me, aren't you? Yeah, yeah <laughs> but I would not recommend that. If you really yeah. want to try it, try Master. But don't use it for production. You wouldn't <laughs> recommend it even for me? Come on, man. <laughs> Well, thing is that we have some changes to the ja mainly Java dependencies, if you recall correctly, maybe some Python and something that is neither Python or Java that we are starting to get from Leap directly. So if you mix both, both things, you can run into problems with the web UI not starting, for example. And then you would need to adjust manually dependencies. So I would not recommend it. Yeah, OK. Well, I'm just asking just to clarify on, uh, you know, what my summer is going to look like. Well, but of course, the fact that we are going to release 2021-06 doesn't mean that you need to update immediately. You can stay on 2021-05 for a while. So that's not a big problem. Not me. As If I see patches are available, that is like my new agenda for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but anyway, don't expect too much trouble. You don't need to have a new instance or something like that. At least on paper right now, I think it, it should be... It can do it all in place. Right. Yes. I think there is going to be a script that you need to run. I think you will need to update one package to get that script installed, and you run the script, and the script should do everything else for you, and you just have a coffee while you wait. Okay, any other questions or comments? If not, then yeah, I would say we can call off the meeting, stop the recording, and of course, wish everyone a very nice weekend. Uh, we reminded you, re remind you that the uni community, uh, uni community hours is not the only place where we can interact. So we still have the mailing list, we have, Gitter, we have Twitter, the GitHub issues, so feel free to ping us anytime. And we are, yeah, waiting for your feedback and contributions if you can, if you can. Thank you very much, Julio. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone. Take care. Bye bye. bye. Thank, thank you. you. Hey guys, guys, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, my name is Daniel Castillo. Uh, I am working with uh, Uni. I am studying on Uni in my platform. Uh, so I am here because I really want to know. I, I, I was reading the last documentation about how to um, register and deploy uh, a new repo of Amazon. Uh, I don't uh, uh, Amazon 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 two a repo for Amazon two. So. Uh, when I try to uh, deploy the new repo, I get a message that say that you need don't have that um, operating system supported. So I really appreciate if someone can share with me some documentation because 
I am finding uh, documentation uh, over the internet on Google about how can I add a new Amazon repo, but I don't have any success on that. So if someone of you can please share with me uh, mm -hmm. some documentation about how can I register uh, my uh, machine? Did you check? Hold on. Um, we are talking about Amazon Linux clients, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what version of Uni are you using? That's the next question. Yeah. Uh, OK, let me check the version, please. Yeah. So I just pasted it in the chat, the documentation. It should work mostly out of the box. But for that, you need you need 2021.05, the latest one. Sure. Is, uh, is that the version? Because I run an update uh, in the past week. So I am sure, I'm pretty sure that is the, the most current version. Mm -hmm. Then, the, yeah, we have official documentation for that. It's the link that, yeah, that Pau just pasted, and it will show you how to add the repositories to the server using Spacewalk common channels that will create the bootstrap repository for you. And then you can just create the uh, activation key and decide how to how you want to bootstrap by a web oh. UI or script. OK, OK, uh, guys, so uh, I am going to check that new documentation, OK, in order to uh, do a double check in order to be sure that I am doing the right things. So if I can, um, if I can do work, uh, I am letting know to you. Uh, if I have any issues, I am going to um, chat with you or connect with you about this issue. But I really appreciate this link and that information, guys. For sure. sure. And if, the if the mailing trouble, list is a good yes. place for that. Those kind of follow-up questions if you still have trouble. Yeah, exactly. Great, 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 guys. So let me um, check the documentation. And I am pretty sure that here I am going to find what is the, the mistake that I am doing. No problem. I'm in the I end, really, if, you have, if you have any problems, we can start at the mailing list, but it could be very well that you can you find any bug. In that case, we will just ask you to create an, an issue at the Union repository, and we will have a look at it as soon as, soon as possible to include the fix for 2021-06. So no problem at that, about that. Just ping us. Great, guys. Really appreciate your time, and that is all. I am going to check that. Thank okay. you again for your time. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye, people. By the way, just one thing, because I, I I see people is like joining now, so I'm not sure if there are yeah somebody kind of messed matter. up on time zone. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's my my coworkers. Yes. I, I, I really invite I just, uh, them in order because yes. we are working right now with a junior project in our company, so. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, invite them to to listen the, the, okay, okay, the okay. meeting. Sorry okay, to, okay. to enter like this, and uh, <laughs> Daniel invite us. So okay. <laughs> no, no came and we're leaving. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we still <laughs> we go. It's the only because we don't. <laughs> but that's because we don't love you. Yes. <laughs> so uh, the recording will be available in the in the YouTube channel in a few minutes. Okay. Great. Okay. Great guys. Okay. Bye-bye. See you bye. then. Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.